Lesson 22, Beowulf. Beowulf is an important story for a couple reasons. The first is that it's the first work of literature in English, right? The first wor work of fiction in English. And second, it initiates the whole genre of sword and sorcery or heroic fantasy or whatever it is that The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit is, a world with dragons and magic swords and heroes who go on quests of, um, to battle these um, monsters and, and uh, restore order to their communities. But it also exists within the structure of a couple of works which we've already read, like Homer's poems and like Virgil's Aeneid, it's an epic. So, uh, so let's turn to the beginning here. What kind of, what is, what can you tell me about the setting and the values established in the setting? They like to get together on these beer benches and drink beer. So this, this is actually firmly within the German tradition because the Germans still do this today, right? They go at Oktoberfest in Munich and they sit on benches and drink beer for days at a time. So this, to these guys, this is kind of the, the meaning of life, right? So we can tell this is from Northern Europe, Scandinavian, and that was all part of the same culture back then. The Danes, the Saxons, the Angles, the Jutes, the Geats, they lived in northern Europe, so they never really came in contact with Greece and Rome. They were never conquered by Greece or Rome or Alexander. So as we mentioned in a couple of lectures ago, they're in a different world. So getting uh, drunk and telling stories with your friends in the, in it was one value. What's another value? Treasure is a big value. Bravery is a big value. Bravery in war. And poetry. I said, in that hall... A skilled poet plucked clear notes on a harp and sang of man's beginnings and of how God girdled the earth with waters and set the sun and moon as lamps for men and carpeted the world with green leaves and quickened life in every moving thing. Now that's a very poetic passage, kind of stuck in the middle of the beginning of this adventure story. And it, you can see the author's attention kind of sloughing off in that direction. And what that reminded me of it was kind of the book of Genesis and the creation of the world and God girdled the earth with waters. It's almost like if you read those first lines of the book of Genesis, the Bible. And then I noticed a couple other things from the book of Genesis here at the beginning of the Genesis, as it were, of this story, the beginning of this story. The first one actually is when Hrothgar turns his mind to castle building, he emphasized a couple times the height of this castle, which reminded me of the Tower of Babel. Does anyone know that story of the Tower of Babel from the Bible? also called the Tower of Babel sometimes. A bunch of people at this place called Babel, they decide to build a tower. They said, we're going to be as great as the gods. Let's build a tower to heaven. So they build a tower that's so high that you can't even see the top of it, sort of like Jack and the Beanstalk or anything else. But they bring together all these people from all these different nations, and they have all these different languages, which is why the place was called Babel, I guess, because no one could understand each other. Then um, I guess God got jealous, sort of like Zeus got jealous, or God got angry and he destroyed the tower. So that's, I thought that was interesting, especially when they say far and wide through the world I have heard many peoples received order, orders for, for work to adorn that castle, implied that people of many different languages were also building um, Hrothgar's castle as they were building the Tower of Babel. And then... Uh, a third thing from the book of Genesis was the reference to Cain and Abel. Who can tell me about Cain and Abel? Well, what happened was they both made offerings to the Lord, and the Lord preferred uh, Abel's offerings. So Cain killed his brother because he was jealous, because God liked his offering and his sacrifices better. And so he killed his brother through envy. And that actually come, is, suits this because... It suits the story because the author tells us that this demon Grendel lived for a time in misery among the banished monsters, Cain's clan, whom God had outlawed and condemned as outcasts. For killing his brother Abel, God made Cain anathema, and from the curse of Cain's exile sprang ogres and elves and evil phantoms and giants who fight God. So what this is saying, it's giving a whole kind of uh, mythology or demonology or uh, genealogy of monsters. 
the text is saying all these monsters are descended from like Cain and Abel, this evil brood, ogres and elves and evil phantoms. So all those creatures like orcs from the Lord of the Rings, basically, according to this monsterology, um, all that comes from Cain and Abel. So the original sin of these monsters is envy, kind of like the original sin of regular ordinary mortals is curiosity. So I find that interesting because envy will operate in the story, as we see, as a motive for the bad people. All right. All right. So now let's move into section uh, two, number section two, where here when they're describing Grendel, I was reminded of the Cyclops. Did was anyone else reminded of the Cyclops by Grendel in any way? One way in which Grendel r r reminded me of the Cyclops was that Grendel's clearly not a political animal and lives off away from ordinary civilization. And there's a couple, there's a few little tells there where they, 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 they say that. They say, Grendel ruled in defiance of right, one against many. So, solitary. Grendel would neither negotiate nor make peace with any Dane, nor stop his death dealing, nor accept any bribe. So he's outside the ordinary structure of law. And as we go on, we'll see more references to that. Then Hrothgar himself, though, is portrayed as rather weak. He sits stricken and helpless, humiliated by what's going on because he can't stop this monster. And then onto this scene, into this vacuum, strides who? Beowulf. And how can you tell that Beowulf is the hero? He's going beyond the call of duty. He's doing something that he doesn't have to do, but which is excellent. So, and also, he is a man with a plan. Literally, it says he announced his plan. So, like Odysseus, he's a man with a plan. And what else about him? Oh, also, we notice, remember when we were, when we were reading Tacitus a few days ago, and he, Tacitus was describing the Germans, and how when they didn't have wars, they would go off in other places to fight wars? to kind of get their skills up and get their reputation, and then they would stay there and have banquets, and the, the host lord would give them horses and weapons and stuff. Well, that's really exactly what happens in this story. Beowulf is following that script, um, which Tacitus observed. That, so hundreds of years later, the Germans are still behaving this way, because as I say, the Germans and the Danes are both these Norman people from a, northern people from a similar culture. Okay, I want to point out something else in section three, which is the use of the device called alliteration. Who can tell me what alliteration is? So um, there's a, especially later on, there is in English a tradition of alliterative poetry. I'm not sure why it's more in English than in other languages, but I think because English is the most rich language with the most words from other languages, there's just a lot more ways of being alliterative and of using that as a device. So there's a lot of ways that you can start words with k, k, for instance. So that's what we get here. Beowulf is described as a canny captain along the currents of the coast. Right? So that's alliteration. Then the next sentence, close under the cliffs, warriors climbed. And then below that, away with the will in the wood ship. And those are very pleasant sounds to the English-speaking ear. And you get something in the uh, mid late Middle Ages, early Renaissance, called alliterative poetry, and a number of King Arthur adventures, and also the story of Gowan and the Green Knight, are alliterative, and they even alliterate according to certain rules, that you have to, you have to alliterate every so many lines or in certain patterns. And that became like a thing. Now let's talk about, in section four, there's this guardian who stands on the ramparts and he watches the arrival of Beowulf. He's what's called, in story theory, a threshold guardian. And this is another thing from Joseph Campbell. He's noted that when you're crossing from the ordinary world into the world of adventure, there's often a threshold guardian which kind of stands in your way and interrogates you and asks you to say who you are and you have to kind of pass him some way by demonstrating your merit or your showing your credentials. In other words, you don't just waltz in. There's always some kind of temple guardian. So, for instance, in China, the temples have these dragons in stone that are set outside the temple kind of to keep evil spirits out or the wrong spirits out or the spirits that don't belong there. In Gothic cathedrals in Christendom, you will see gargoyles up on the ramparts 
Same idea, threshold guardians, separating the sacred space or the special space from the ordinary space. So in this case, the guardian at the border between the ordinary space and the special space of the adventure is this um, watchman. And he says, uh, you know, you got to tell me about yourself. Who do you think you are coming in here and like that? And if we notice, if you read the whole Odyssey and the whole Iliad and the whole Aeneid, there's a number of these threshold guardians that the heroes have to um, submit to questioning by very often. So in other words, when Odysseus gets to a new island, the people will say, who are you? Tell us who you are, what country you come from, what is your business, right? So that's a standard mo story structure, um, a standard story motif in epic especially. Okay, so um, let's go on. We know that Beowulf is pretty special because it says that he has the strength of 30 men in the grip of each hand. So that's a unusual thing. And let's see what else. He's had, he's, he has a, 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 he's done some pretty cool things before he even came here. He raced at sea with his friend with a sword on his back, we, we hear. And that was pretty cool. And then another thing is, he says, I battled and bound five beasts, raided a troll's nest, and slaughtered monsters in the night sea. I have suffered extremes and devastated enemies who brought doom upon themselves. Now I mean to duel Grendel, settle the outcome in single combat. And here we get this idea of single combat with certain rules of fairness, which anticipates or is drawn from the ideal of chivalry. What's chivalry? Can anyone tell me that? Being a man of honor... These are all important things, treating women fairly and rescuing people in distress. So even the idea that Beowulf's coming here to help out is itself a really chivalrous thing. And when we get to the King Arthur legends and when you read them more broadly, you'll see that King Arthur and his knights are constantly do-gooding. They're going out uninvited to <laughs> do justice and bring justice to people in distress. So the cardinal case of that would be, oh... An um, evil ogre has kidnapped a woman and put her up in a tower, right? And so Lancelot or some other knight will have to go and rescue, this, rescue what's called this damsel in distress. A damsel is a, a word for a maiden, okay? So this is key to the genre, and it uh, also was a big part of the code of chivalry, rescuing people in distress, but also how you fight. So he says, um, because... Be uh, Beowulf says, because he's heard that the monster scorns in his reckless way to use weapons, I hereby renounce the sword and the shelter of the broad shield, hand to hand, a life and death fight with the fiend. Whichever one of us dies must deem it God's just judgment. So this idea, sometimes they would say, even in medieval times, if one person accused the other one, you stole this and that, or you attacked so and so, and they couldn't settle it in court or out of court, so then they would settle it by combat. And they say, well, God will award victory to whoever is the right, who's telling the truth, which, of course, is we would regard as nonsense. <laughs> the, the person who's lying could also win the battle. <clears throat> but part of their worldview of fate was that God would award victory to the whoever was just. So Beowulf is proceeding under this understanding, which is very medieval and very much part of this feudal world of chivalry. Then again, there's this jealous guy called Unferth, whom we meet in section 5. And how is he like Grendel? It says, Brave but under a cloud for killing his brothers. He envied Beowulf and all the attention the king paid him. How is that like Grendel? Well, in fact, uh, the text does tell us that Grendel is jealous. That's almost the first thing that the text does tell us about Grendel. So in Hollywood, if you're ever writing a screenplay, they always tell you to make your character's first action be a defining action of that character. So the first thing you see the character do should define that character. So the first thing they say about Grendel is that he could not bear the happy daily banquet in the hall. So he's jealous, okay? He couldn't stand it that someone else was happy. And Unferth is the same. 
he envied Beowulf and all the attention the king paid him. But that's also like Cain and Abel. So all three, all three of Cain, um, Cain, Grendel, and Unferth all have envy. So they're part of this brood of monsters or evil that comes from envy. Because just like Cain, Unforth had killed his brother. And just like Grendel, he envied. And just like Cain, he envied. Because Cain, um, because Cain envied all the attention that God paid Abel. And so Unferth envies all the attention that the king pays Beowulf. So you see how this kind of fits together in this kind of triad or trilogy of envy. And envy being the motive of the evil people. Because the evil people have their own motives too. They might not be good motives like the heroes have. But this is a powerful story because... Not only the good people have motives, but the bad people have motives. And they're actually human motives. They're not just abstract things, um, like uh, uh, wanting to do evil for its own sake. But all humans feel envy, right? So the monster is being humanized here, and that's one of the reasons that this is regarded as a great book in its way. Um, even though it's actually regarded as supposedly the most boring book you could ever read, if you read it in its original form, and that it's even a line in a Woody Allen movie, just don't take any class in which they make you read Beowulf. But I believe that in this form, we can, we can digest it, um, because I think it reads pretty well. So what else happens here? We get um, Beowulf vowing that he's going to kill Grendel or die trying. And the king says, I will give you whatever you wish if you make it through alive. So these almost seem like cliches to us now because we've seen them so many times in movies. I'll do X or die trying. Uh, uh, and then, you know, you'll get whatever you want. You'll get your wish if you make it through alive. This is almost like today, almost cartoon-like in its simplicity, but it all comes basically from Beowulf. This, these are the standard tropes and tricks of the writers of adventure stories. Again, section six, emphasizing Beowulf's chivalry. He says, I won't wield my sword as I told the king I wouldn't. Grendel has no idea of the arts of war, of shield or sword play, although he does possess a wild strength. No weapons, therefore, tonight. Unarmed, he shall face me if he dares. May God grant victory to whomever he sees fit. Again, repeating that idea of uh, fate and uh, deciding your fate and deciding the question of who's right through combat. Perhaps through the strength of one they might all prevail. So that's a kind of opposite of what's said about Grendel at the beginning. One unjust person fighting the justice of the whole community. The opposite of that is one, um, one man who, in whom the community finds all its strength and prevailing over this monster. Perhaps through the strength of one they might all prevail. Okay. So let's go again to section bottom, further down in section six. When, when Grendel attacks, how is Grendel like Cyclops in these lines? The creature struck suddenly and started in. He grabbed and mauled a man on his bench, bit into his bones, bolted down his blood, and gorged on him in lumps, eat, eating him up hand and foot. How is that like the Cyclops? All right, so Grendel lives apart doesn't obey the laws, uh, and eats people. So these are all ways in which um, the uncivilized forces of the world were characterized going all the way back to the beginning of the Western tradition in Homer. And here we see them popping up again in Beowulf. So this is why we do this, so we can trace these patterns and themes and say, aha, here they are. Uh, these, are, these are defining the way we think about things in the West and the way we represent things in the West. Um, so a Beowulf, after defeating uh, Grendel and ripping his arm off and bringing it back, says to the king, Your Highness, we have gone through with a glorious endeavor. We fought and dared against the unknown. How does that remind you of the Greek idea of heroism in any, in any way? Anything seem familiar about that to anyone? Like... The idea of doing what someone hasn't done, the idea of doing something extremely challenging. So they have a similar idea of excellence, and I guess it's basic to this kind of heroic warrior's code. Um, but it's not in the service of your country. It's really in the service of simply being excellent, almost for its own sake as like a personal religion. 
Then we hear um, that meanwhile, envy remained in the world. And here's Unferth again in, in section 8. Meanwhile, evil remained in the world. Unferth the jealous Dane hated seeing the splayed hand high in the wall, proof of Beowulf's prowess. Every nail, claw scale, and spur, every spike and welt on the hand of that heathen brute felt like barbed steel in Unferth's heart. Again, this idea of envy, which is common to Cain and common to Grendel and common to Unferth. Um, so let's go on below. We get this victory banquet, and Beowulf gets these treasures from the king, right? And the king gives him this victory gift. They have this feast. Everyone's drinking. The bench is filled with famous men drinking round upon round of beer. Powerful kinsmen and high spirits, nothing but friendship, feud and betrayal still unknown among them. That's almost like a Garden of Eden or a Beer Hall of Eden, right? Betrayal still unknown among them. So this is an, kind of an idyllic experience. They may have been eaten by monsters, but they've never betrayed each other. So this is a band of brothers. And the king gives Beowulf this victory gift in a new mail shirt and a helmet with a special edge and a precious sword and eight horses with gold bridles and one with a special um, battle saddle. Beowulf relaxed and drank his drink, showered with these gifts in front of everyone. So few moments in so few lives could ever feel so sweet. So this reminds me of an ode of Pindar, which I'm not sure we read. I know it was in the original draft of this book. But it talked about the life of the athlete, how basically it, the, I, the athlete or the hero eventually dies like everyone else, but for a few brief glimmering moments, they know heroism, okay? They know what it's like to really live. And you know what? I think that's kind of interesting that here we're getting the same idea. So I'm going to read the Pindar because it reminded me of that. Um, he who suddenly wins some noble prize in the rich years of youth raises himself high with hope. His manhood takes wings. What he has in his heart seems better than wealth. But how brief that season of man's delight. Soon it falls to the ground. Some dire decision uproots it. Man, thing of a day, a shadow in a dream. Yet when God-given splendor visits man... A bright radiance plays over him. How sweet life feels in that moment while it lasts. That's from an old ode uh, by the Greek poet Pindar, who was way back, you know, around the time of Herodotus and Heraclitus, you know, 500 B.C., even earlier probably, uh, maybe the 7th century B.C. But that tone of how sweet that moment of life is while it lasts, that life of the hero, reminded me of what, the author of Beowulf says, so few moments and so few lives could ever feel so sweet. So that's a, a kind of reward that these heroes have. And I think we can recall uh, moments in Harry Potter or moments in uh, The Lord of the Rings where the heroes kind of have these moments. They're often in front of everybody and it's kind of a, maybe it's a grand thing at Hogwarts where they have that banquet where the food is magically serving itself. But there's times where you just, you say, ah, you know, it's just so great to live this hero's life and to actually know success. So that's part of it. If you did all this stuff and you never felt that reward, somehow the adventure story would feel hollow if, if that didn't happen. So meanwhile, while all this is going on, the knights drank wine at that rare feast, not knowing the threat that loomed, the grim shape of things to come. So there's this sense of doom in, in these, in these um, heroic works that... Yes, you can have these moments, but fate is always around the corner. Death is always around the corner. A monster or some kind of evil, something is always around the corner. And in this case, it's yet another instantiation of the Cyclops. In this case, it's Grendel's mother. She's described as an unnatural birth. And she, uh, she looks like a woman, okay? Um, but... But like her son, she's one of these fatherless creatures, their whole ancestry hidden in a past of demons and ghosts. They dwell apart among wolves on the hills, on windswept crags, where cold streams pour down the mountain and disappear under mist. So I've been reading today, I've been reading back about the Cyclops, and they also dwell among these caves on windswept crags. 
So I wouldn't say that the author of Beowulf copied um, the Cyclops story from Homer, but there's a lot that's similar there. Okay, So we get an another thing that's a first, a kind of Greek first. No man has ever seen the bottom of the bog. So Beowulf will be the first man to see the bottom of this bog. To go where to go to boldly go where no man has gone before. He's gonna dive into this bog or swamp and see the bottom of it. Now help depends again on you and you alone. The gap of danger where the demon waits. Seek it if you dare. That is a an extremely uh, succinct summary of the heroic ethos. Then there again there's this line that describes the hero's kind of existence and the code by which the hero lives. For every one of us, living in this world means waiting for our end. Let whoever can win glory before death. When a warrior dies, gone, his glory becomes his best and only battlement. So that's again this idea, it kind of goes back to Hector in the in the Iliad, and Achilles in the Iliad of the warrior getting immortality through the glory he wins in battles. Um, so then we get this kind of intense scene where, where we have Beowulf fighting Grendel's mother at, by diving under the surface of this water and emerging in this cavern. And while he goes on this adventure, we get a, another first in this story. And that's the first appearance, as far as I can tell, of a named sword, which becomes a big part of these stories. The king handed him a hilted weapon, a rare and ancient sword named Hrunting. The iron blade with its ill-boding patterns tempered in blood had never failed in battle. And then Beowulf says, showing he's a true hero, If this combat kills me, please take care of my knights, my comrades in arms. Now with Hrunting, I shall gain glory or die. So even as he goes off to face what seems like a likely death, He's not thinking about himself, he's thinking about his friends and asking the king to take care of them if and when Beowulf does not return. So that shows the largeness of spirit. Beowulf is a great-souled man. So he goes down and he has this battle, which is quite fantastic, and there's some really cool stuff, like when he uh, shoots uh, an arrow at these monsters in the water. All kinds of reptiles infested the water. On slopes by the cliff, on slopes by the cliff, writhed sea dragons and monsters, serpents and wild things. Beowulf shot an arrow from his bow and hit one of the creatures as it surged on the surface, the shaft sticking deep in its flank. In the shallows, the geats cornered and overwhelmed it, prodding it with barbed spears, pulling it up on the bank, gazing at their loathsome catch in awe. So meanwhile, so meanwhile, Beowulf goes down, and this magic sword actually fails him, so he has to do it all on his own. Right? So it says, Beowulf flung away his sword. He would have to rely on the might of his arm. So must a man do who intends to gain enduring glory in combat. So what happens is that he emerges in this cavern and he has this wrestling match with Grendel's mother. And while he's down there, he sees another sword on the wall of this cave, which I have to say is, is quite convenient for him. But it's so heavy that only Beowulf can wield it in battle. And that is another thing that reminds me of Homer, because in the same way that Odysseus was the only person who could bend back this bow and shoot it through all the axes, so Beowulf is the only one who can hoist this sword. So part of the hero of epic poetry is part of the uh, heroism of the epic poem is doing something that no one else can do. That's how you can tell the hero. Now, as if by magic, the sword began to glow. It glowed so brightly that it lit up the corners of the cave. Beowulf inspected the vault with sword in hand, held high like a torch, its hilt raised to guard and threaten. He saw lots of treasure. So that's like straight out of Dungeons and Dragons, holding up this magic sword, and it lights up this cave that's filled with treasure. That was used on like the cover of maybe half of the Dungeons and Dragons adventures which were printed and published in the 1970s. So that's an archetypal sword and sorcery thing. So with that, we come to the end of the reading for tonight.